Hello, folks. Welcome, 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 welcome to another Shopper Intelligence live webinar. Now, I can only see three people according to my screen, but I'm reliably informed there's more of you out there. So that's good news. How are you feeling? You feeling good? I hope so. I hope so. If you are, maybe get involved straight away. Give us a thumbs up. Let us know uh, that you are in good spirits. If you're, if you're down in Melbourne, I hope you're okay. I hope. Uh, Hello, I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, but hello, it's nice to see you there. Um, Te Tejas, I'm guessing that is, yes. Ali, no, good to see you, Ali. Great, thanks for the thumbs up. If you guys are down in Melbourne, I hope 4.0 isn't, uh, isn't going too badly. I hope you're coping with that well. Maybe if you're not in a great place, but you're psychologically in a great place, and give us a double thumbs up. Just let us know how you're feeling. My name's David, and I'm going to be taking you through the next 45 minutes or so with uh, my colleagues, who I'll introduce you to in just a very short moment. Now, if you work in liquor, and I'm guessing there's a pretty good chance that you do, which is why you're on this session this morning, and you want to do better business, and you want to do it by better meeting shoppers' needs, then this is absolutely the place for you. Now, the topic today that we're covering is very, very important because we have seen something through our research that has changed over the last 12 months. And it's really, really important that we take note of this in the industry and that we do something to work smarter in order to respond to it. So our promise today is twofold, really. Promise is, first of all, I hope that you're going to leave with some knowledge and some information today that you don't have right now. But beyond that, our promise is that you will take away from today some real, practical, tangible things that you can go away and do something with today in your role. That's our promise. That's the value that we want to add for you today. So hold us to it. I know a whole bunch of people are uh, giving the thumbs up. So please, Annette, a double thumbs up. Great. So too, Thomas. So um, hold us to that promise and, uh, and let us know how you're feeling through the chat throughout. Do you like it, dislike it, agree, disagree? confused, excited, whatever it is, let us know. And remember as well that uh, you're going to get the recording so you can play it back at your leisure time after time and share it with your friends and family um, to listen to at another time. And you'll think you'll get that probably uh, within a few hours of the session closing. Now, if you don't mind, there's one question that I did want to ask you, and it's not directly related to liquor as such, but it is it is very closely linked to us sharing value with you through sessions like this. Now, I can still only see six people, but I know there's more than that out there. Probably, what are we on now, guys? 40-odd? 81. 81. Wow. Okay, fantastic. So look, 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm guessing, is not a bad time to run a session like this. But we would like to do more of this. And so it makes sense just to take a quick uh, temperature check of what your preferred time is for a session like this. So I'm going to go ahead and launch uh, a quick poll. Just tell us what your preferred time is to attend uh, a Shopper Intelligence live webinar. Is it in the morning? Is it maybe in the afternoon, two or three? Or maybe it's even in the evening, maybe seven o'clock. You put the kids to bed, you've had dinner and you'd like to sit down and listen to our dulcet tones in the evening. Whatever it is, thanks very much for letting us know. I'm seeing big votes for the morning, which um, which good, which is good. We're on the money. But I'll let that run for a little bit, and um, we will take all of that feedback on board. Right. Let me go ahead and play around with the screen a little bit so you can see what is going on. Hopefully, you can see our opening screen. And I'm going to flick straight from that, because what we want to get into, really, is what the um, what the crux of the day is all about. What are we going to be talking about? What are we giving you? Uh, you are going to be very pleased to hear that it's not going to be my voice that you'll be stuck with for the next 40 minutes or so. So I'm going to introduce the team very shortly. But um, beyond that, what are we going to cover? Well, after we've uh, done our intros, we are going to get straight into why there is a need for change and why there is a need to act now. So Ming is going to take you through that. Then Simon's going to give you a perspective on, well, what good looks like. If there's a need to act, then what is a framework for acting? What is a framework that you can use to do something differently? And then finally, tailoring the conversation. That is all about uh, how to actually make it happen. So Ming's going to give you a really simple, practical demonstration of how you can take some of this information and apply it when you go out and talk to the trade. After that, we'll have some questions and some discussions, and we will close out all things being well in about 40 minutes or so. Hope that sounds good. Again, let us know. Give us thumbs up. Keep engaged. Um, 
I think it's time to talk to the rest of the team now, isn't it? I guess. So who else is in the virtual studio with me today? Well, um, I'm going to start off with uh, with the boss, the big cheese, the head honcho. We call him Simon because that's his name, Simon Ford. How are you doing, Simon? Hello, David. Hello, everybody. I'm very well. Thank you. You well? Good, good, good. Can you, um, it's, it's a year, we just realized, since we first did, uh, did a webinar, our first liquor webinar, actually. Can you tell, it, tell us, articulate how excited you are about this particular session? Can you put it into words? Well, I'll try for you. Um, yeah, I am excited, actually, because, I mean, obviously, it's a massive year. Uh, that goes without saying that we've had, um, and, but particularly in liquor, uh, a massive positive year for many in the off trade in terms of sales. Um, and yet, as we'll hear today, uh, a bit of a um, bit of a call out, bit of a concern from the shopper in terms of deteriorating satisfaction levels. There's more complexity going on in terms of omni-channel <laughs> customer journeys, the way we uh, the way we talk to our customers, our, our shoppers, uh, pre-store. Uh, you know, channels, online, e-commerce, threatening, um, or at least making it more complex in terms of how that whole customer journey happens pre-store. And then in-store as well, we're seeing some big flags in terms of shoppers saying the shelf isn't quite working as well. So I'm excited because, uh, you know, it's great that we're seeing good sales, but there is a big reason to sit up and, and listen to the shopper this year, more than any other year, genuinely. Um, and yes, so indeed. let's talk about it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I can feel your excitement, Simon. I can right. feel you've, you've, you've preceded the session very well. So thank you for that. Now, a quick question, actually. Tell me, what was the last thing that you bought in a liquor store? What category? Uh, I can tell you, probably because you told me you were going to ask me this. Um, <laughs> I bought a, a couple of bottles of Pinot Noir in uh, Liquorland last Friday night. Uh, very nice. Home when I was shopping at IGA for some food and it was next door. Okay, very good. Ah, yes, I know. I know where you were. I know where you were up in Allenby. Right. Okay. So uh, my second question, and the reason I'm asking this, folks, will become clear in a minute, but was that something that you'd planned to buy? Did you plan that category purchase before you went to the store? Or did you decide to buy into Pinot Noir just when you arrived in store? Which was it? Well, yeah, I did plan to buy it, albeit like, well, you know, 15 minutes on my drive home, having been told by my wife that I had to do some shopping. Um, uh, I thought, right, well, I'm going to buy some wine as well. So it was a plan, <coughs> um, although the um, the decision to the brand and everything else that I bought within that was more uh, was taken at shelf. So I knew knew broadly what I wanted when I got to the shelf. That's when I made my, my choice. Okay, very good, very good. It's handy having that liquor land on the way home for you, isn't it? Very much. So, yeah. Um, good. Okay. So the reason why I'm asking that will come clear in a minute. I'm going to throw that out to, to you all as well in a moment. But uh, now, let me turn to Ming. Ming, good morning. How are you? Morning. I'm doing very well, David. Thank you. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Now, Ming and I work very closely together. And what I'd like you all to do for a moment is just to focus very, very intently on Ming's face, just for a second or two. Just for a second. Because what you find is that you can tell Ming, Ming's mood very, very quickly, just from that second and a half. The signs are good. Look, yes, we're in, we're in a good Thank place. She's, she's in a good mood. Excellent. All right. Now, I said we've, we work very closely together, and we've been out delivering State of the Nation in liquor to a whole bunch of people, quite a lot of different um, um, renditions over the last few weeks. What's been your, what's been your biggest highlight, biggest takeout so far? Uh, biggest highlight is probably getting to see everyone face-to-face -face again. <laughs> um, quite refreshing very different um, but also I find it really exciting that we can now report on some of our game changes so we've been tracking seltzers or new world um, premix as we call it over the last year and also the online channel yes yes I think that is probably one of the things that's got people most excited is the, uh, the section that we've got on on new world RTDs situation in seltzers maybe a topic for another day if that's something you'd be interested to hear from us uh, on in uh, in a live webinar maybe let us know in the chat super okay Ming final question for you last liquor purchase what was the category it wasn't a purchase per se but last time I was in a liquor store um, seltzer actually <laughs> so my friend um, brought it over, he was behind the bar, so brought it over for me to try okay. my first seltzer, which I, I enjoyed. Say, if it wasn't a purchase per se, did you nick it or what? No, no okay. he, um, it was a friend. Yeah, a friend. <laughs> <laughs> planned or unplanned? Was it, was it uh, predetermined? Unplanned. 
So I went okay. down. I was just waiting for my lunch to come out. So went over to say hi. Got okay. a seltzer. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Right. We will come back to you very, very shortly, Ming. Uh, let me throw this up to, to you all out there as well now. What was the last category that you bought in the off-premise? What was the last category you bought in a liquor store? And had you planned to buy that category, not, not necessarily the brand or the type in that category, but had you planned to buy that category before you went in the store? Or was there something that triggered you to buy that category when you got into store? The reason that is important will become clear very soon but it'd be great to get some uh, some views from you as well justin yes bring on detail renew world uh jenny yes oh hello jenny haven't seen you for a while how you doing um would like to hear about new world rtd um i i think that's pretty much unanimous so maybe we'll have to do that uh, notes to selves ming and i and uh, and simon we must make that happen okay so should we crack on with it i think we should we have talked about working smarter. We've talked about the need to do something different. So clearly there has to be a reason. There has to be a rationale for doing that. There has to be a why, if you like. Now there is a burning platform. Simon has alluded to it. I've alluded to it. Uh, something that needs to be responded to. And so Ming is going to share what that looks like, what it is, what is this burning platform with you now? Ming, over to you. Thanks, David. So. As David and Simon have both alluded to now, there is a burning platform within liquor. So sales were incredible last year and there's been some good progress in some areas, but shoppers have told us that they are less happy with their overall experience than they were the year before. So what you're looking at here when David flashes it up is um, shoppers experience, um, shoppers overall satisfaction in liquor trended over the last five years. And this is the first time we've seen the market has ever gone backwards in terms of how satisfied shoppers are. So the orange line there is your big box, which is your Dan's and your first choice, and they're down a shade, but the convenience banners, which is your BWS, Liquorland, Vintage Sellers, and your Indies, they've dropped noticeably more. So some of you may not be familiar with our data, so what do we mean when we talk about satisfaction? Satisfaction is made up of 16 individual metrics, which include things like price, quality, authenticity, range, layout, and so on. And overall satisfaction is then the roll up of the delivery of these metrics weighted by their importance to shoppers. So what you're seeing in this chart is really significant because it addresses the overall experience shoppers are having in the channel. And if you're looking predominantly at sales data, you will miss this very important perspective and the direction of travel that it indicates. And put simply, if this goes unaddressed, it will eventually lead to declining sales. Now, uh, I can't, um, sorry, David, that just really tripped me out. I can't see if the slide's up there or if it's just my face, but <laughs> I'll talk to it as if the slide's on over. Slide is back, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, put simply, if this goes unaddressed, it will eventually lead to declining sales. But here's another very important aspect to the situation. So the change shoppers have registered is not even across the market. And in fact, it's very uneven. So as you can see here, there are big variations um, how shoppers from different banners have rated their experience over the last year. So four actually saw their satisfaction score increase, um, two of them being in the Coles group, so your vintage sellers and first choice. Um, and on the other hand, BWS and Dan's shoppers have said they're less, less satisfied this year. So if I was putting my supplier hat on, there are two very distinct conversations to be had in the industry right now. One is around collaborating to maintain momentum and the other one's around helping to address these areas for improvement. And I know we have some um, retailers with us today too. So there'll be, you know, there'll probably be some questions around what we're seeing here. And I'm sure there'll also be a desire to work with those supplier businesses who can bring strategy to the table that will best support wherever your banner is sitting on this chart. Can we just put the full chart on, David? Mm. It's just cutting off the uh, logos. So for those of you wondering what the what the logos there are, uh, oh, there we go, it's there. Okay, sorry, carry on me. Thank you. You got it? Okay, yeah. yes. I did my best to throw you there, but you wrote it well. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, thank you for that. So there's something specific there. I mean, you can see we can see IGA on the uh, on the right a plus eight. That's a that's a big increase. What's um what's going in there? What's some of the dynamics, Ming? Yeah, so IGA has done really really well. They had a really good opportunity last last year to show shoppers what they could do with the lockdowns and everything. They played really well to you know the local community and the local um, authenticity around their banner, and they did it really really well. So that. Mm. That we, we saw that across grocery and also bleeding across into liquor. Yeah, quite, quite. As you say, something we saw in, in grocery as well. The last 12 months was a was a fabulous opportunity. If you operate a, a smaller footprint store, a local store, you had the opportunity to really highlight and showcase credentials and, um, and the banner did it exceptionally well. John, you, your question here, what drove the increase in convenience satisfaction growth in 2019? Uh, good question. The Obviously, it's made up of those 16 different measures, so there's a lot of different things that go into it. Predominantly, it was around price measures. So the the uh, the pricing that the, the convenience banners, so everything except uh, Dan's and, and First Choice, the pricing that they were offering, the um, the sense of everyday value, the ability to identify value at shelf, most of that increase, or the, a large part of that increase in satisfaction, came out of that area of of our measurement. Uh, and yeah, to a degree, that's that's become sort of uh, pay to play. That's you know, it, it, you've got to be in. It's necessary but not sufficient, if I can put it that way. Um, but as uh, as Ming says, we've seen something really, really exceptional. First time ever that we've seen this in uh, in the last twelve months or so. Okay, Ming. Thank you. So we'll go down to the final part of this sec, uh, first section, and this part really underscores how the platform is not burning evenly across the industry. So there are those 16 metrics of importance and performance that we talked about earlier, and each banner faces its own set of circumstances. So if I just take two of those metrics, price and layout, you can really note how different things look. So first of all, price, which means good prices in the category, is down by 2% according to shoppers at a total channel level. And um, John, to your question, you know, this is the first time we've seen this measure go backwards. It is generally on an upward trend um, with big box driving down prices with their lowest price guarantees and convenience competing really hard with that. But if we just look at the two big box players, we see, you know, different fortunes here. We see dance shoppers less happy with prices in the last year by 2%. But first choice shoppers tell us prices have improved by 3%. So these swings have now put first choice higher than Dan's in terms of price satisfaction. And this is the first time that we've um, seen first choice beat Dan's or even be close to Dan's um, in terms of the level of price perception. And then secondly, the second metric I'll talk to is um, layout. So layout means the, sh a shop the shopper's ability to find what they want in the category. We also see huge variations at banner level, um, so down 2% overall. But BWS shoppers are saying it is now harder to navigate categories, whereas vintage shoppers, vintage seller shoppers tell us the opposite. So this has obvious implications on the in-store environment, which we'll talk to a little bit more later. But the key takeout from here is, you know, there's something brewing in the channel which sales data won't necessarily reveal. Um, it's a shift we've never seen before in terms of overall satisfaction, but it's not uniform across the industry. And finally, it needs to be explored in detail, measure by measure, banner by banner, in order to fully diagnose the challenges and opportunities that present themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ming. So, look, I hope you get a sense of uh, of the gravity of this, really, as, as Ming was pointing out. First time we've seen satisfaction overall decline. First time that price uh, and, and perception of, of good prices in categories has gone down. It's worth saying that some things have gone up and some important things have gone up as well. In, in the year that we just had, the fact that perceptions of healthy choices and delivery of healthy choices has increased and improved according to shoppers in off-premise, that's, that's good. Uh, perceptions of innovation, so new ideas in off-premise, they've also gone up. Uh, and uh, so is this notion of, of providing options to help shoppers drink responsibly. Now, these are all three very important dynamics and dimensions during a year when there was a lot more liquor being bought and that whole question about responsible drinking and, uh, and so forth has been uh, very, very prominent in the media. But let us not uh, shy away from the fact that there are some, some challenges here and these are the lead measures 
that you can look at now to foretell and forestall what could be coming down the track and act now to get ahead of the game. Ming, thank you very much for that. Um, going to, I'm just looking at John's comments, but I'll come back to that in a minute because I want to bring uh, bring Simon in now for the second component, which is building on this notion that there is, if you like, an imperative. So there's something we need to 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 respond to here. Um, so question then is, what is the response? What about that response? And is there a useful, if you like, pathway that uh, that we can share with you? And uh, I have a very strong feeling there is, Simon. Well. Indeed, indeed. So um, Ming has talked about the, the reason for change. Um, and what I wanted to do now is talk about how we might go about that. Um, and this is based on, on my experience. I mean, we work with uh, about 14 suppliers um, and, and a couple of retailers in, um, in liquor in Australia, but also uh, 60 or 70 across uh, channels, grocery, liquor and so on in Australia and New Zealand. So uh, I have a, a experience of seeing different models of uh, how suppliers are set up. Um, it's also a reflection actually can bring it back to Australian liquor from a retailer <laughs> angle. Um, and I will give you a quote from a senior executive at a major uh, liquor retailer here in Australia. Um, and it is, I want suppliers to understand my shopper and proactively come to us with their strategy, uh, not just make products that fit our strategy. So there is a genuine desire from the retailers uh, to have suppliers come in uh, and talk to their business, their customers, their strategy, and, and not just uh, mirror it with their products um, and their plans, but also help them drive it um, and develop it in the first place. Um, so here's, here's the model. Um, there are three stages to this. Uh, the first one we'll call sophisticated selling. Uh, this is really reflective of how suppliers certainly were set up you know, back in the good old days, back in the 80s when uh, brands led the agenda um, and certainly retailers and shoppers were far less powerful and influential than they are today. Um, and a lot of manufacturers were set up really to be all about the brand. Brand plans drove everything. Uh, if category existed, and that's an if, uh, then that story was spun and it was very much a sell into the retailer at, at back end. Now, as category thinking's become more mature through the 90s uh, and into the 2000s, and certainly retailers uh, started to become more powerful as well, um, then we have what we might call category thinking, uh, where brand plans and category plans exist. Um, but they do work in silos. And so really, they only really come together at the back end of the plan in terms of, again, a, a sell to the retailer. So, you know, maybe you're in a business that has a strong marketing and brand led um, division, and I'm sure almost all of you are. Um, but maybe you've also got a category team and maybe you're thinking, well, there's a little bit of a disconnect between how the two operate, you know, sales versus marketing, that sort of thing. Um, and, and spinning stories at the last minute uh, when you need to get your NPD sold in or whatever it is you, you're talking to retailers about. Now, what does good look like? Well, really the next step on from that, um, and we do see this in Australia, um, and there are examples of companies doing this really well, uh, is integrated planning. So this is where genuinely category thinking and brand planning coexist. Uh, the, the lines of communication and the process and the mindset that exists within the, the business is strong. And critically, it's all upstream. So it's right at the beginning of the strategic planning process uh, where these, uh, you know, it's not just about how the brand wins, it's how the category wins and how the retailer wins. And that alignment with retailer right upstream again, right at the beginning of the process. What is it we want for our brand? What is it you want from your store? What is the right thing for the category uh, and the shopper and the consumer all you know, connected together at the beginning? And then that follows through um, follows through the, the process. So I think at this point, um, as, as David's having fun with our visuals, um, <laughs> I think David's got some more fun. Can you handle you. any more? If, you, if me messing around with the screen every 30 seconds wasn't enough, um, I am trying to uh, configure it so that we're not covering the screen, so you're seeing the person who's speaking. So bear with me. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit fiddly. However, yes, so we good now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. We do have another poll. So yeah. Simon has just talked through these these three phases, sophisticated selling, you've got your category thinking, and then you have your integrated planning approach. 
Now, I'm just going to launch a, a quick poll around these stages of development. And um, I'd invite you, if you want to get, get involved with this one, just in your experience, which stage is the most common in the industry today? If you recognize sophisticated selling, pretty old school category thinking, maybe quite common, I'd imagine, quite prevalent. Integrated planning, perhaps less so, but maybe from place to place is happening, is working out there. Uh, we're going to leave that to uh, to roll for a little bit, and then um, we'll come back and have a look at that shortly. Or maybe we'll we'll uh, give it a go now. Uh, do, 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 do. I can still see people voting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close. And interestingly enough. I now can't see what the scores are. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up again. Now I can tell you, Simon, because I don't know if you can see this, but the response is 18% sophisticated selling, 72% category thinking, yeah. and the balance of about 10% integrated planning. What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I, th I think uh, that would be my thoughts too. <laughs> uh, I think most companies uh, have moved on from sophisticated selling. It's, it's very unusual. It still does exist, actually, uh, but it is relatively unusual. Um, most companies have category thinking, whether it's a, a person or a, a team um, or just a mindset in, in the business that, that sits um, in there. But um, companies struggle with... Um, with the silo nature of it, which is, I guess, why most people are voting two rather than three. And there's a couple of things there. One is the mindset of, of the business. You know, um, of course, you've got strong brands. That's what your whole business is built on. So it's hard to get out of that and, and say, well, that's important, but, but we've got to line up category and, and retailer at the same time and give the same weight of importance. So there's a mindset thing. There's also a process. Um, the mindset might exist, but there, there needs to be processes, you know, reporting lines. Um, where does category sit? Is it marketing? Is it sales? How does it work between the two? Um, it's it's hard to get that process right. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk with anyone about the companies that are doing this and what that looks like. But the final thing really is then about how, you know, how do you start and how do you get to three if you, if you feel you're at two? Um, and, you know, it's hard. Um, it's not silver bullet, um, you know, mm. not least because retailers might not want we might feel retailers don't want to hear it, don't want to be involved, or we're getting pushback. Um, I'd suggest you know start simple with a, a friendly buyer or a low risk uh, initiative or brand uh, in your business. Uh, get the retailer involved, and, and it's all about the shopper, right? The the thing that glues category brand and, and retailer together is the shopper. It's the common currency that drives uh, all of those three things. Um, build a plan based on it, and and mm. where. Where we do work with those types of companies is is where we uh, can play and do play a role in the that first meeting and say, look, this is the objective view of the shopper in the category. Um, here's the opportunity for growth for all, um, and then you know let you guys get on with it in terms of the commercials around that. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, take that first step. It's what I'd encourage. Yeah, yeah, indeed, and and I guess you you know you pointed out that there's there is undoubtedly a mindset to this, right? The 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 whole kind of it is possible, we can do it. It's not easy, but you know that's what we're here to achieve. Uh, I suppose the the cynic in me, and there may be a cynic or two out there, might have said, well, three is three is aspirational. You can't really achieve three. Now we've we've had at least ten percent of the audience say that they feel that that is out there, so that's that's sort of dispels that to some degree, but. I suppose you do need a little bit more than just a can-do attitude, right? I think that's what you're you're kind of alluding to there. We're, we're getting into the domain of impact and influence to a degree here, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if if you if you believe something's going to happen, then it probably will, right? So if if you're if you're taking the impact, uh, taking the point of view that oh, I can't change anything, then you're probably right. Um, however, <laughs> if you turn that round and say, okay, well, it's your job, it's our job as an industry, um, certainly my job to help you um, to do that, then um, I, I think we can, and we, and we are in places. Um, and I see John's asking if, if the mm. retailers think that as well, then, well, the answer is uh, to a degree, yes, they are. And that's reflected in the, in the, um, the statement that I started with in terms of, uh, I'll say it again because I've got it written here. I want suppliers to understand my shopper and proactively come to us with their strategy, not just make products that fit our strategy. So they, they are asking for number three. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it's hard. Uh, it takes a while, uh, but they're asking for it and it, it can be done.
Yeah, yeah. Look, thanks for that question, John, and, and thanks, Simon, as well. I know we have, we had, we certainly had plenty of uh, of uh, retail retailers subscribe to the session today. I don't know who's uh, who's out there, but if you are and you want to chip in and, and perhaps give your uh, give your views on this, then by all means, feel free to um, to get involved, but put your thoughts down. Uh, the other thing I just finally add on that is that that past performance is a great precursor of future future success, and even if you feel that one scenario is not uh, is not that welcoming of this kind of approach that that integrated planning approach going and delivering it and landing it where it is uh, where there is an open door where there is a, a, a mentality towards that is going to be a great example to take to the next conversation and the next conversation and the next conversation so I guess you know I, I, this is just this is just practical kind of common sense but banging your head against the same closed door is not necessarily the great uh, the greatest strategy but going and looking for the opportunities and talking to this where there is a, a, an open door or a door ajar is going to give you the evidence that you need to um, to replicate that elsewhere okay so thanks again for uh, for that Simon and uh, we're going to speak to you again shortly now I think you're going talk- to speak to me straight away, aren't you? Uh, am I going to speak to you straight away? I think you might be. I've still got another slide. I've still got something you more. Have. Hey, David. You have. I, I felt like there. You still had more to give. How about this one? <laughs> yeah. Listen, I just wanted to finish that and say, look, let, let me give you a practical example about how you might do this. Um, and the the headline here is talk to their shopper, not a shopper. And and again, I'll just reference a, a retailer this time, a, a, an independent. Um, that said when when suppliers come in using data from another retailer as a proxy for my customers, I get very frustrated. Um, and so the principle here is uh, there, there is no such thing as the generic shopper, even in your category, uh, because shoppers do behave differently uh, depending on uh, the, not just the banner they go into, but it's really led by mindset. Um, and occasion is, is a good example of this. So uh, you can see on the slide there that those um, uh, shoppers in bottom mark coming in uh, 49% of them had a particular occasion in mind. Um, so in other words, not just for everyday drinking, but I'm coming in because I want to buy something for dinner or for, to take to a party, that sort of thing, uh, which is different in the same channel, but different banner uh, to BWS. There's a, a significant difference around that. Um, and you might think, well, that's a nice to know, but you know, it's it's really the, the fluffy stuff marketing can get on with. I mean that in the nicest way, but actually, no, it's, much, it's not that at all. It's much more important than that. It's actually fundamental to how you trigger the trigger the response to buy the category, whether that's pre-store, through the customer journey, through omni-channel, through digital, uh, or whether it's in-store at the shelf. Um, you have to align with the occasion uh, to then trigger that purchase um, and maximize um, the execution of that. Um, as an example, we know from our own data that there is a significant difference when somebody is in the mindset of an occasion versus stocking up. Um, and uh, they are significantly more likely to uh, want innovation, to want to see uh, the range and browse the range. They're significantly more likely to look for the narrative or story behind the brand. They're significantly more likely to pay a price premium for uh, the choice that they come up with. Um, they are significantly less likely to be driven by price. And certainly price is, is a hygiene factor. It's supportive, of course, always will be, but it's not the trigger as well. It's not the lead uh, trigger in terms of making the decision. So, so this is more than just a, a supportive metric around uh, you know, how shoppers are thinking. This is actually fundamental to how you set up your store and, and your pre-store uh, marketing comms and, and everything else. Um, and Clearly, there's a difference between retailers and, and categories and so on. So uh, really important that you understand that. So mm. as I hand back to you, David, the big lessons are <laughs> um, go for alignment um, and integrated planning um, and talk to their shopper, not a shopper when you do. Yes. Nice. Nice. Like it. Uh, just something I was going to add there, a little, little anecdote. I had a phone call from uh, a representative of a major drinks business and um to your point there simon about this not being a sort of peripheral thing this being an integral thing a foundational thing that we're talking about here just even in sense of of shoppers as a whole the the comment that came from this uh from this contact was we've just done a massive massive piece of work we've spent an enormous amount of money on revisiting rethinking how we're approaching uh, our, uh, our liquor business and our liquor clients and customers and 
now that I start to think about Shopper in a bit more detail, I feel like we have missed something really important. We didn't bake this in. We didn't have integrated thinking. Uh, we probably maybe stage two to some degree, maybe even somewhere between one and two, but we certainly weren't integrated in that thinking from the off, and we are now having to go back and retrofit. And of course, that is, is the last thing you want because you invested, you've done the work, you've made the plans, you want to start going and rolling out, and then you're trying to think about, oh God, how am I going to land that with this customer and this customer and this customer and talk to their shopper, not a generic shopper. So baking it in from the start makes that a whole lot easier. All right then, so we are, what are we, 11.35, we've got about 10, 15 minutes left and it's now time to get down to the business end. If you take this out to a retailer, if you take this approach, what is it actually gonna look like? How can you actually bring this to life? Uh, so we are going to close out. I think I'm handing back to Ming, aren't I? I know, no, I know I'm handing back to Ming. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, tailoring the conversation. What does it look like? Um, and how does you actually make this come to life in practice, Ming? Thanks, David. Um, so we saw two fundamental shifts that took place in liquor last year. And these shifts, you know, play a new, a big, a big role in how, where, and what you invest in through 2021. So first we saw more decision making in store. And secondly, we saw big changes in the occasions that shoppers were buying different categories for. So with the first one, shoppers are now less planned at category level in the channel. So this means they're more likely to decide on buying a category only once they were inside the store. And this has three implications. So the first one being um, to your in-store approach and activations. Second, that the shelf needs to work harder. And thirdly, that there's, there's a discussion there to be had around clean store policy and the appropriate level of disruption within the in-store environment. And then with usage and occasion shifts, so for example, we saw pre-mix and spirit categories becoming much less likely to be, uh, much more likely, sorry, to be bought to be um, to consume with a meal. Now this means three things, so three implications as well. Firstly, every category should be reviewing what shoppers are using it for. Secondly, it means responding very quickly to new opportunities and also to threats once they're identified. And thirdly, the implications on how you activate and talk to shoppers in terms of hooking onto these new occasions and usages. But to Simon's point and David's point, it's not a generic conversation to be had across the market. Um, remember, this is about integrated planning um, where category thinking is embedded with brand plans. So let me round out today with a, um, a simple illustration of how your conversation might look very different in two banners for the same category. So out of out the 34 categories that we track, I've picked vodka premix for today. Um, and now before we get into any banner level, we've seen vodka premix shoppers less likely to plan to buy the category before entering the store than they were 12 months ago but it's not by that much. So they're two, uh, around 2% less planned than they were last year. But if we look at the story within IJ Liquor, um, what's going on here, we're seeing vodka premix shoppers in IJ Liquor becoming less planned, but at a much greater shift than their category in the total market. So now almost half of their shoppers are deciding to buy vodka premix only once they are inside the IGA store. So here you have a really strong argument um, towards more in-store engagement, um, investing in in-store activations, in-store inspiration, and emphasizing in and around the shelf. So the opportunity is to communicate more at shelf. And this is a really great example of a scenario where you want to upweight on that aspect and not rain back on it. And shoppers are telling us that if you dial up the shelf and your in-store comms, um, it will be beneficial for this category specifically. And secondly, the biggest occasion shift seen in vodka premix in IGA is this relaxing at home occasion. Um, it's a 14% increase, so it's um, making it the biggest occasion for this category in this banner. So the action here is about hooking up your in-store comms and your messaging um, with this occasion and making that association clear temp and being able to tempt impulse purchases at shelf. But if we look at the same category, so premix vodka, but in another retailer, we're looking at um, vodka premix through the eyes of the first choice shopper. We're seeing completely the opposite to what we saw in IGA. 
So here we see an 11% increase in the decision being made before entering the store. So in other words, a lot more planning to buy this category pre-store. And this is bucking the trend for the category as a whole, and it's bucking the trend for the channel as a whole as well. So here you really want to be, um, you know, there's, there's little value in dialing up messaging at the point of purchase, um, although you might still have a case depending on um, the levels of switching shoppers report. But here you want to be winning the decision and triggering the shopper before they set foot in first choice. So pre-store comms. And your next question might be, you know, what would be the best way to do this? Uh, well, shoppers tell us catalog is the biggest trigger in first choice when vodka premix is a planned purchase, uh, followed by coupon and then TV or poster advertising. And then to round out this mini story, this is one of the scenarios where we've seen a big increase in the usage of a premix category to accompany a meal, so plus 12%. So that's one category in two retailers. And just looking at these two measures, we can already see how a very different approach and story is appropriate for each one. It's not a one size fits all. And um, it's not a generic category shopper and you can't assume that it is. And on top of this, decisions are being made differently um, year on year. So you need to keep mm -hmm. evolving your activations in line with growing opportunities. Very good, very good. I couldn't, I, I think the, the, the difference, the polar difference between just those two examples, one category, two banners, just two measures is phenomenal. And it gives you, I, th I hope, I think, a very clear indication of uh, the level of granularity, the level of detail you can go into to go and deliver on that that need that Simon was talking about, to talk to their shopper, talk to a specific shopper, not a generic notion of a shopper. One thing I wanted to share with you very quickly, because we've had some great questions in and, uh, and there's plenty to talk about now in the next few minutes, but I just wanted to add an extra little bit of value for you. So I'm going to open up this uh, handout, just something you can take away and have a look at. We've talked about how uh, decisions at category level are becoming more unplanned, more decisions are being made in store. So what we've got there in the handout is the top 20 unplanned liquor categories as we sit here and speak to you today, 2021. So you can have a look, see where you'll sit, see what else is around uh, in, in terms of uh, the importance of un, uh, unplanned decisions and what that therefore means in terms of activity and action. Have a look, see what you think. Let us know if you've got any questions. You can contact me after the session and, uh, and we can talk it through. Now, there's a point there about in-store decision-making, about what's going on in-store. And I didn't prime this, but Ali has hit the nail really on the head with this question because it's where we were going to go anyway. Um, I will flick on to uh, question time because that's pretty much where we are now. But Ali's question was, with more decision-making happening in-store, would that be a suggestion that the clean store policy is no longer optimal? Team, discuss. Simon, you go first. No. <laughs> no, no is a simple question. It's a very, very um, uh, important reason for clean store policy, and that's because it's the right thing to do uh, in the right banners, in the right categories a lot of the time, um, particularly when the mindset of shopping is, I know what I want, you know, I, I, I planned it, I'm, I'm coming in for it. So, um, you know, in, in the world of grocery, it'd be the white milk shop, you know, you need to keep milk simple, uh, get in and out beer would be uh, an obvious one in, in this uh, in this channel, um, or certain types of beer, uh, not craft beer. Um, however, actually, that's a good, that's a good example of it's it's the right banner in the right category. So, uh, you know, it's not a one size fits all. It's the same thing that we've been talking about in craft beer. Absolutely. You need the shelf to work hard for you. People are looking for, for range and inspiration. Uh, they are looking for um, in, in certain categories, they're looking for, uh, you know, certain occasions and the, the products to be linked with that occasion to, to make that solution work for them. Uh, they know they want to go to a party and they know that they want to impress their friends, but they haven't figured out what they want. And they're looking for that for the store. Um, or the website, uh, if we're talking e-com, to inspire them uh, on that. So that that is the role of certain stores and certain categories. And you know, Bottle Mark talked about the occasion being dialed up. That that as a banner works more like that. First choice we've seen is a big box. It works less like that. But there are uh, uh, examples of categories within each of those banners where it would be the other way around. Yes, yes. Uh, Ming, we were out in a session recently, weren't we? Where 
we talked about this and uh, look, it was a fair challenge. Someone in the in the group said, yeah, but I, I can't I can't do anything about this stuff. You know, this is this is what I get told. This is what the retailer strategy policy is. Uh, so, you know, it's great that you tell me this, but, you know, tell me something I can I can actually action. And um, yeah, we, we, as we said before, we're in the we're in the territory of impact and influence. And, and as with most things in life, what are a couple of the principles when you want to influence somebody? You start with a good view of where they are in the world. Start at their bus stop. You understand the challenges that they face, understand what is going on in their world, which is all about what's happening in terms of their shoppers. How are their shoppers engaging with them? How are their shoppers experiencing things? What are their shoppers doing? And then you use evidence to make a strong case, just as, as Ming did really in that uh, in that final piece around how you piece different pieces of evidence together in a logical way and you do it in a compelling way you take you take brand out of it to a degree at that stage and you talk to category and you talk to their motivations and their needs so i think that that remains very very powerful um justin i was just looking at your question uh, is vodka number one in premix um there's a there's a there's a lot of different number ones that we could we could be referring to. I'm not sure if you you're thinking sales or um, planning or, or or lack of planning or unplanned. Let's touch base afterwards because we're not sure what the uh, what the right answer is, but I'm sure I can give you an answer of some description. Um, I think there were a couple of other questions. One at the beginning yeah. was around New World RTDs. You might want to just touch on that as a synopsis of what we're finding, guys, um, yeah. and then possibly e-com as well if people are interested. But yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll touch very quickly on on New World RTDs, but I don't want to say too much because I think we've got another session we can spin out of that one. Um, New World RTDs is not just seltzers. I think this is the really interesting thing that we've we've uh, taken out of this year's research. We added it as a new category. It's seltzers. It is uh, alcoholic kombuchas. It's it is uh, shochu. Not easy to say at any time of the day. Um, and various other components, alcoholic ginger beer as well. What we found is it's performing very very well so shoppers are really really happy as a category with a lot of aspects of what's going on there but when you isolate seltzers and let's let's remember seltzers is the big thing that's uh, that's forecast to deliver billions of growth over the next couple of years satisfaction looks very very different and there are some very important areas that the industry both retailers and suppliers should be thinking about getting on top of when it comes to seltzers specifically a lot of things that are underperforming being under delivered versus perceptions of the category as a whole um love to go into that in more detail with you if you're interested in that give us uh, give me a shout after the session and then yeah so i'm just touching on this point about um well, omni-channel and and the different touch points and how we get under the skin of that. I know you, um, and I know Nancy in uh, in our business having a lot of conversations around this sort of stuff at the moment. What's your uh, what's your nutshell kind of take out of all of that right now? Yeah, look, the, the, a couple of angles on that. One is the customer journey uh, in terms of the the um, you know old school P and G thinking is it's a linear path to purchase and there are moments of truth and so on. I mean that's that's changed clearly uh, it's a multivariate model in terms of all the touch points you can have digital paper catalog um, uh, you know website social media uh, everything pre-store um, and and i say it's not just um, pre-store digital it's pre-store stores as well so you know some people will uh, research in store and then buy online so this whole um, journey, if you like, is is uh, complicated. Uh, we are now measuring that in terms of uh, you know what's working well, what levers are working well uh, across the industry by category, by banners, and then where the purchase ends up. So it might end up in store, it might end up online, might be a click and collect or a delivery. Um, we are looking at that. So watch this space um, over the next year. Um, and then, of course, the actual uh, e-com experience as well of, of you know shopping online and 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 buying online, if you like, um, we are uh, uh, looking at that as well and launching a program around that. So um, it's here, it's step changed uh, and uh, through COVID um, and uh, yeah, more to come. Quite, quite. Incidentally, we will also be releasing to our subscribers the latest online liquor research in, what does it mean, four weeks? Have I just take you start in two weeks from you? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'd say six, eight. <laughs> six. Let's go split in the middle. Go six. Six <laughs> weeks. So uh, if you're a subscriber, you'll get uh, you'll get visibility on that. And uh, I guess to, to round out 
on the, the, the trio, if you like, in liquor, we are also finalizing our work in the on-premise. I'm not going to talk much about that today, but it's just worth uh, noting that that's, uh, that's just come out of field. And I have a feeling there's going to be some pretty significant learnings and some pretty significant findings in that part of the, uh, the liquor world as well. Um, Taryn, I've seen your point. I think that's one we can pick up afterwards. So specific, uh, specifics about individual categories. Um, how does the, the shift compare to prior years? What's driving it? So we can definitely get under the skin of that. Um, love to see the opposite. So I love to see the plan, top 20 plan categories. Yes, Stuart, give us a shout. We'll, um, we'll have a look into that. Um, and also the comment about seltzers. So I feel, I feel, Ming, we can start working on the seltzer session now pretty much. Um, would be great to see on-premise trends. Is there, is there any key channel which helps buyers make the decision to buy? Hmm, interesting question. I, I'm feeling it's, it's kind of probably more nuanced than that, depending on, as we're saying, the banner and the category. Yeah, but, that's, the, um, that's the omni-channel uh, mm -hmm or customer journey piece of work that we're doing to answer that question. You know, where are where are decisions made? Where's the trigger point? And is that different, not just for different types of shopper and category and banner, um, but different uh, end ways of buying it, so if that makes sense. So um, in store or online, it, it mm. might be a different part. I'm sure it will be a different part. So that's right. the analysis we're doing uh, through the next year. OK, folks. I know there's other questions. We'll kind of have a look back through all of this and see uh, see if there's anything else that we haven't picked up on. And by all means, if you didn't hear your question being answered, then uh, get in touch with me. I'll give you my email address in a moment. Quick checklist for today as we wrap up then. The platform is burning. As Ming said, it's not burning evenly. It's not burning brightly all across the board, but there is something going on. And it's now time to respond to your lead measures, where you have measures that are giving you insight into what shoppers are likely to do going forward that's the stuff you want to use and blend it with your lag measures. Identify the opportunities and the challenges now. And start to, if you are not already on that journey from, let's say, stage two, where we feel the bulk of the industry is, moving and shifting that paradigm into stage three, striving for that notion of integrated planning, difficult though it may be, but really embedding this concept of category thinking from the off. Remember that anecdote, don't leave it until you've done all the work and then try and retrofit it back into your plans. And last but not least, I think we've, uh, we've talked about this a lot, make it personal. Home in on the key shifts that affect the business and the category that you're going to speak to. Build a relevant story and that is going to help you to gain the best traction. I'm not going to sit here and Simon or Ming is not going to sit here and say that is definitely going to get you over the line, but it's definitely going to help. Um, and there is definitely the opportunity for to have someone like us come in and support and tell that category story alongside you as well. Folks, all that remains to be said, I think now is um, quick thank you. Thank you to Simon. Thank you to Ming. Thank you to David. Thank you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you to everyone who's taken part today. Thank you for uh, taking the time and investing. I hope we've repaid you with the value and the promise that I talked about earlier. Let us know and thank you for getting involved. Last few seconds to download the top 20 unplanned categories. Um, keep shoppers at the heart of your conversation is my parting word. Follow us on uh, LinkedIn at Shop Intelligence ANZ for all the latest news and updates and insights from our team. And if you have specifics, anything you'd like to follow up on, there's my email address. Give me a shout after the session. Folks, take care, stay safe, and uh, see you again very soon. Thanks, everyone.